Hi, hello, and welcome to the Word. No one can line up the miracles and actions of Jesus in chronological order because the Gospel writers reported them at different times and some totally different from the other. Because we have been focusing on the life of Christ after his fast in the wilderness, which came from Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we have neglected John because his account is slightly different and can even pose a challenge to the lineup of things, the chronology of things. However, we will give John's account the center page in this study. We will go back to the baptism and then we will come forward. Ready to study? Let's get started. If you remembered, I talked about how difficult it could be for someone or anyone when he or she reads the account of John. While Matthew and Mark said that Jesus went into the wilderness to be tempted right away and spent 40 days there, then came out and called his disciples, John says that the next day Jesus called Andrew, who called Peter, who called Nathaniel, and the next day they left Jerusalem and went to Galilee. And the next day, they were invited to a wedding. But before we read the word, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are humbled by what you have done through Jesus Christ. As we read, we get greater appreciation for the healing and the resurrections and the teachings. May we understand exactly what we read. And may we be enlightened only by your word and not by additions of men. For these can lead us into unnecessary territory. Guide us once again into the study of your word, we pray. For we ask it in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Okay, let us read the ending of John 1, going into chapter 2, verse 35. The following day, John was again standing with two of his disciples. As Jesus walked by, John looked at him and declared, Look, there is the Lamb of God. When John's two disciples heard this, they followed Jesus. Jesus looked around and saw them following. What do you want? He asked them. They replied, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come and see, he said. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon when they went with him to the place where he was staying, and they remained with him the rest of the day. Verse 40. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of these men who heard what John said and then followed Jesus. Andrew went to find his brother, Simon, and told him, We have found a Messiah, which means Christ. Then Andrew brought Simon to meet Jesus. Looking intently at Simon, Jesus said, Your name is Simon, son of John, but you will be called Cephas, which means Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Come, follow me. Philip was from Bethsaida, Andrew and Peter's hometown. Philip went to look for Nathanael and told him, We have found the very person Moses and the prophets wrote about. His name is Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nazareth? exclaimed Nathanael. Can anything good come from Nazareth? Come and see for yourself, Philip replied. Now there is absolutely no account for the 40 days of the fast. All we have is the next day and the next day. So the day after his baptism, according to John, Andrew brought Peter. Then the day after he found Philip, then Philip went and looked for Nathaniel. The next account will take place the day after. So we can say three days after Jesus' baptism, this happened, which is normally called his first miracle. In John chapter 2, verse 1, the next day there was a wedding celebration in the village of Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the celebration. The wine supply ran out during the festivities, so Jesus' mother told him, They have no more wine. Dear woman, that's not our problem, Jesus replied. My time has not yet come. But his mother told the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Standing nearby were six stone water jars used for Jewish ceremonial washing. Each could hold 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus told the servants, fill the jars with water. When the jars had been filled, 
he said. Now dip some out and take it to the master of ceremonies. So the servants followed his instructions. When the master of ceremonies tasted the water that was now wine, not knowing where it had come from, though of course the servants knew, he called the bridegroom over. A host always serves the best wine first, he said. Then when everyone has had a lot to drink, he brings out the less expensive wine. But you have kept the best until now. This miraculous sign at Cana in Galilee was the first time Jesus revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. After the wedding, he went to Capernaum for a few days with his mother, his brothers, and his disciples. Now, I think it's going to get warm in here because of what is about to be unfolded. Now, what did you read about Jesus' mom and their invitation? It says Jesus' mother was there. That's all it says. It does not give us any connection with the bride or the groom. It also says Jesus and his disciples were there. They were invited. It does not say why they were invited. Now, I'm going to do the same thing that I did last week with Hannah and Sister White. You can choose to stick around for some learning or you can choose to walk away. It's your choice. Now, most people know about Ellen White and her background, but few know about William Hanna. Let me give you a moment to get acquainted with him. I'm reading from Wikipedia, the free encyclopedia. William Hanna, 1808 to 1882, was a Scottish minister known as a theological writer and as the biographer of his father-in-law, Thomas Chalmers. He was born in Belfast on the 26th of November, 1808. He was the son of Reverend P Professor Samuel Hanna, a minister of the Presbyterian Church of Ireland. He studied at the University of Glasgow, going on to the University of Edinburgh, where he studied under Thomas Chalmers. He died in London, 24 May, 1882. He is buried in the Grand Cemetery in South Edinburgh in the plot of his father-in-law, Thomas Chalmers, against the North Wall Works. This next quote comes from the preface of his book, The Life of Christ. The lecture of which these volumes consist were all written in the course of weekly preparation for the pulpit and are given as they were delivered Sunday after Sunday to an ordinary but well-educated Christian congregation. This fact will sufficiently explain the presence in them of much that might otherwise be regarded as irrelevant or superfluous and the absence to much that might otherwise have been deemed essential. Now, having read all of this, you must be able to picture this more as collective sermons than just writing a book, as it is said. So some elaborations are intended for an audience. But regardless if it is a sermon or a book, we must understand that no one should speculate on Scripture. We are re-emphasizing that it is a dangerous thing to do because some people don't hear a speculation, but they hear a fact and repeat that fact. Every misinformation leads to either a misaction or more misinformation. Listen to what William says on the presence of Jesus' mother as well as the disciples and Jesus being there at the wedding at Cana. Occurring in a narrative like this, where the regular succession of events is so accurately chronicled, we naturally, in coming to the expression, the third day, interpret it as meaning the third day after the one that had immediately before been spoken of, that is the one of Christ's departure from the banks of the Jordan. Two days easy travel carry him and his new attendants to Nazareth, but there is no one there to receive them. The mother of Jesus and his brethren are at Cana, a village lying a few miles farther to the north. Theda they follow them and find that a marriage is being celebrated there to the feast connected with which Jesus and his five disciples are invited. One of the five, Nathaniel, belonged to Cana and might have received the invitation on his own account as an acquaintance for the family in whose house the marriage feast was held. But the others were strangers, only known to the family as having accompanied Jesus for the last few days. Their tie of discipleship to him, quite a recent one, and as yet scarcely recognized by others, that on his account alone and in consequence of a connection with him of such a kind, 
they should have been at once asked to be present at an entertainment to which friends and relatives only were ordinarily invited. Would seem to indicate some familiar bond between the family of Nazareth and the one in which this marriage occurs. The idea of some such relationship is supported by the freedom with which Mary appears to exercise, speaking to the servants not like a stranger, but as one familiar in the dwelling. Besides, if Simon called the Canaanite was called so because of his connection with the village of Cana, his father Alpheus or Cleophas, who was married to a sister of Christ's mother, may have resided there. And it may have been in his family that this marriage occurred. Could we but be sure of this, which certainly is probable and which early tradition affirms, the circumstance that when Jesus seated himself at this marriage feast, he sat down at a table around which mother and brothers and sisters and uncle and aunt and cousins of his own now gathered. It would give a peculiarly domestic character to the scene and throw a new charm and interest around the miracle which was wrought at it. At any rate, we may assume that it was in a family connected by some close ties, whether of acquaintance or relationship with that of Jesus, that the marriage feast was kept. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith to him, they have no wine. Well, you know where I'm going with this. William Hanna has given us loads of speculations. John 21 does say that Nathaniel is from Cana, but speculation concerning the connection to Mary and then Jesus, none of that is certain and should not be added when explaining the scripture. It should simply say that Mary was there and Jesus and his disciples were there. We do not have any details on that. If it is okay to speculate now, then later when someone else does it and it does not fit our favor, we will call it adding to God's word. Now, I would have said this before, so you must open your understanding. Don't miss this because it will determine how you approach the Bible. When Paul was writing, when the gospel writers wrote, they did not consider their accounts to be scripture or the Bible. Let that soak in. So when Paul said all scripture is given by inspiration of God, he was referring to the Old Testament. Is that clear? So when Luke wrote the book of Luke, he was not thinking that he was a book for the Bible. It was later when the early church decided to compile the books of the Old Testament and the Apocrypha, these are the books after the Old Testament, and books that comprise the New Testament that we got the Bible of 73 books. When the Catholic reads all scripture is given by inspiration, he also means the Apocrypha books. However, the Protestants considered these books uninspired and took them out. Daniel was out earlier. The book of Revelation was also out. Now we have 66 books comprising Old and New Testament and everything therein is considered the Holy Bible. And also inspired. Now the obvious problem we face with that is that whatever is written in the New Testament is inspired. So God told Luke what to write. But remember, I am inspired to do this video. Your pastor is inspired to preach or anyone for that matter. But there is another level of inspiration which is the prophet inspired and Paul inspired where God spoke directly to men and women. God did not speak directly to Luke to tell him what to write. God did not speak directly to me to tell me what to say. I believe God is illumining my mind and I use my own words. But when it comes to prophets, they give a new word that was not there before. God is saying something fresh to his people. Or God could be repeating something that he has said before, but it was not heeded to. I am referring to Israel here. We would see Paul in the New Testament saying that God taught me this and God told me that. It was that inspiration important for us? It was to correct any errors of the past and to highlight what is correct for the future. So with this in mind, I want to say to the person who understands scripture this way that you are correct if you are thinking that the gospel writers were not writing on the direct word for word inspiration. Now a good question is, if God is about correcting errors, why didn't he make sure that the four gospel writers said the same thing and there were no discrepancies? I will never attempt 
to answer that question for God. But you know some person who feel that they must answer every question will give an answer and mess it up. Well, God wanted us to trust him through all the different narratives um, and so forth. The answer is simple. People write differently and remember things differently. You must also remember that everything cannot be written. So this brings me to my point. Unless the information you give is something like Jerusalem is 20 miles from Nazareth, so it would take them two days by foot, etc. You must not and should not give speculations like what Hannah did. Stay away from that and stick to what was given and deal with the main context of what was given. Sometimes we feel it is too plain and as intellectuals we need to bring in some more stuff. So if there were eyewitnesses living still, we could add to these accounts. But without that being the case, we should not. Even if you say this is not really the Word of God. The Word of God is the Old Testament. Even though you say that, we should not add to or speculate on historical um, or spiritual stuff. Last week, we saw that Ellen White did the same thing where she quoted a thought that was not presented in Scripture. Let us go to her book. The Desire of Ages, where we are comparing Hannah and her. From the Jordan, Jesus had returned to Galilee. There was to be a marriage at Cana, a little town not far from Nazareth. The parties were relatives of Joseph and Mary and Jesus. Knowing of this family gathering, went to Cana and with his disciples was invited to the feast. Now, now. Why would Ellen White make such statements if she is not paraphrasing the speculative thought of Hannah? This is not an inspiration thought. It is not divine information. This is adding what is not given via speculation. She did not even speculate on this one. She just makes the statement as if it is a fact. And there could be a perfect answer. Well, she is speaking on behalf of God etc. Listen to what Dr. Tabor said in Biblical Archaeology Society. Given this background, all we can do is speculate. I think we can assume that Mary, the mother of Jesus, is somehow involved in the wedding. And since we know Jesus and his disciples, as well as his brothers, are there, it is not a passing event, but some kind of family affair. And since he returns to the place when things get heated for him and his disciples, in Judea, it is a safe place for him and one to which he is connected. So whose was the wedding? Or can we even make a wild guess? Many have suggested that the wedding at Cana was that of Jesus. I find this unlikely, even though the account is very allegorical. As it comes to us in John, and it is accordingly hard to derive historical material therefrom, the way in which Jesus shows up with his disciples when his mother and brothers are already there indicates to me that the wedding is of someone else. My own guess would be that it is the wedding of either one of his brothers or sisters since Mary is involved. Not as I read it, as the hostess, but as one concerned with the provisions for the wedding. Since the wedding is held in Cana, my guess is that it could very well be the wedding of one of Jesus' brothers, perhaps James, to a sister or daughter of Nathaniel. See what I'm telling you? All of these speculations of who had the wedding, some say it was Jesus' wedding. Can you imagine how far we went to say that this is Jesus' wedding? But there is another aspect to the story. This was Jesus' first miracle and his time was not yet. Let us go over what Jesus said when his mother asked the question. Dear woman, that's not our problem. Jesus replied, my time has not yet come. Why would he respond like that if it were family members? You can tell Jesus was not connected to the people. Verse 6, standing nearby were six stone water jars used for Jewish ceremonial washing. Each could hold 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus told the servants, fill the jars with water. When the jars had been filled, he said, now dip some out and take it to the master of ceremonies. So the servants followed his instructions. When the master of ceremonies tasted the water that was now wine, he not knowing where it had come from, though of course the servants knew, he called the bridegroom over. A host always serves the best wine first, he said. Then when everyone 
has had a lot to drink, he brings out the less expensive wine, but you have kept the best until now. Now the miracle was not healing someone or raising dead, it was to supply a need of a drink at a wedding. It happened simply, water in, wine out. Obviously we have to find out if it is fermented wine or not. To those who would accuse me of using one text to make a point, I have a study on wine, so please go to it. But we are dealing with this account, so listen up carefully. The first thing we will do is go to the Greek word, then we will hear what Hannah says, then what Ellen White says, and then close our study. We looked at the word for wine, we get oinos. Wine means the juice from the grapes. Remember, wine comes in two forms. First, the freshly squeezed grapes juice that will last for a few days, and then the fermented juice that will last for a long time. It is normally said that the word can mean both alcoholic and non-alcoholic. It all depends on the context. But remember, fermented wine was more widespread than the grape juice since it lasts longer. Hence Jesus saying, you don't put new wine in old skins. The wine stayed very long in the skins. He could not be speaking of grape juice since it had to be drunk within a week. Freshly squeezed grape juice cannot burst old wine skins. There is nothing in its composition that can do that. But fresh fermented wine is strong enough to do that. Okay, let's go further to the context of the passage. When the master of the ceremonies called the bridegroom, he told him that the host always serves the best wine first. Then when everyone has had a lot to drink, he brings out the less expensive wine, but you have kept the best until now. Verse 10 in the Greek. And says to him, every man first the good wine sets out, and when they might have drunk freely, the inferior you have kept the good wine until now. Note that normally the good wine is given first and the inferior is given after they have been drunk with the good wine. The rationale behind this is that since they are already drunk, they will not be able to tell the difference between the first and the second or since they are tipsy. Next point to note is that freshly squeezed grape juice is not sold as good wine versus inferior wine. Fresh grape juice will be the same. Freshly squeezed orange juice is the same all the time. But good wine is different from inferior wine, which the Roman soldiers could afford. It was almost like what we call the vinegar. It is an after fermentation that still had a bite to it, but was not real alcohol. We are going deeper into the context. And you might say, Pastor, it says they might have drunk freely, which is just the past tense of they might drink freely and that does not mean alcohol. And you should get a tap on the back for being so keen to see through my lack of understanding English. So there is only one way to find out if you are right. The Greek word itself, from which methosin is conjugated, methu, it means to be drunken. To be drunken, I am intoxicated with wine, I'm drunk. So the word is not the past tense of drink. The word itself is to be drunk or intoxicated. So let us continue to put the context together. This is for those who shout but don't have a clue of what they speak. So the master of ceremony, or the master of the wedding, is saying the custom is we bring out the good wine, which has to be fermented wine, so that when the people are drunk, that's the only way you could get drunk, they will not decipher um, the other set of wine, which is inferior. But you have brought the good wine out last. How in God's earth can you say that this means the good wine is grape juice? You have to define all reasoning to say otherwise. You would have to form your own dictionary or your own Bible concordance to change the meaning of the word and hence the context. So let me give it straight. Jesus was at a wedding where alcoholic wine was served first because it was a custom and it also tastes better than the inferior wine. But when the miracle was performed, it tasted more aged than the good wine. And the good wine was like the inferior. And you argue that God would never give alcohol to the people. Regardless of how you rationalize it, the miracle performed had nothing to do with grape juice. 
but in the realm of fermentation. I am not adding to the scripture, nor am I suggesting or speculating. I am just opening up the facts to you. So you see why you cannot study the Bible with just your King James Version? You would just be reading, but not studying. Let us see what Hannah says. The miracle lay in the instantaneous transmutation of water into wine. And yet the water with which those water pots were filled and in which this change was wrought might have been drawn from the well of a vineyard and instead of being poured into stone vessels might have been poured out over the soil into which the vine plants struck their roots and by these roots might have been drawn up into the stem and through the branches then distilled into the grapes and out of the grapes being pressed into the vat and in that vat have fermented into wine and thus by the many steps and secret processes of nature might that water without a miracle as we say have been converted into wine but is each step or stage of that natural transmutation less wonderful does it show inferior wisdom is it done by a feebler power just as little can we explain the process as spread out into the multiplied details in the great laboratory of nature as when condensed into one single act. And just as much should we see the divine hand and power in the one as in the other. He who sees God in the one, the miracle, and not in the other, the processes of nature, has not the right faith in God. In other words, the process that water takes to go from rain poured on the earth to water, then into the grapes and to its fermentation, it is done by the same power who can do it in one instance. Now you have seen how I used proper exegesis to come to the conclusion of the text. Hannah maintains that the wine was a miracle. Our next stop is Ellen White. Will she share the same biblical sentiments since she normally copies from Hannah in thought? Neither the ruler of the feast nor the guest generally were aware that the supply of wine had failed. Upon tasting that which the servants brought, the ruler found it superior to any he had ever before drunk, and very different from that served at the beginning of the feast. Turning to the bridegroom, he said, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine. And when men have well drunk, then that which is worse, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. As men set forth the best wine first, then afterward that which is worse, so does the world with its gifts. That which it offers may please the eye and fascinate the senses, but it proves to be unsatisfying. The wine turns to bitterness, the gaiety to gloom, that which was begun with songs and mirth, ends in weariness and disgust. But the gifts of Jesus are ever fresh and new. The feast that he provides for the soul never fails to give satisfaction and joy. Each new gift increases the capacity of the receiver to appreciate and enjoy the blessings of the Lord. He gives grace for grace. There can be no failure of supply if you abide in him. The fact that you receive a rich gift today ensures the reception of a richer gift tomorrow. The words of Jesus to Nathanael express the law of God's dealing with the children of faith. With every fresh revelation of his love, he declares to the receptive heart, Believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than these. My gentle people, I don't have to tell you that this is a total mix-up here. This may sound nice, but this has nothing to do with the account we are reading. We are now taken into a flurry of spiritual talk about wine turning bitter and things move from good to bad in this life. And Jesus gave good gifts. That's the poorest commentary on this account. Now, is she going to copy Hannah? But no, she can't because this would be completely against Adventist unbiblical teaching on wine. Hear this. The gift of Christ to the marriage feast was a symbol. The water represented baptism into his death. The wine, the shedding of his blood for the sins of the world. The water to fill the jars was brought by human hands. But the word of Christ alone could impart to it life-giving virtue. So with the rites which point to the Savior's death, 
it is only by the power of Christ working through faith that they have efficacy to nourish the soul. Come on. The water represented baptism and the wine, the shedding of his blood. That is what you call clear-cut deviation for what is standing before you. What about that could be inspired? I told you it's the most dangerous thing that Christians can do when they take the Bible and determine what they want to symbolize here and symbolize there. Unless Jesus or God tells us from his word, we must not put any meanings and symbolism to anything. Take the Bible as it comes to us. There is nothing in the passage that says that this was a symbol to anything. It was simply a marriage. So she begins to say that whatever Jesus gives is to nourish the soul, is to prepare to make the passage say fresh grapes in the future. The word of Christ supplied ample provision for the feast. So abundant is the provision of his grace to blot out the iniquities of men and to renew and sustain the soul. That is true, but unrelated to the account. That is like having a conversation with someone about cars and uh, the person says, but God is good and wonderful. Yeah, I know that. But what does that have to do with this specific discussion on cars? At the first feast he attended with his disciples, Jesus gave them the cup that symbolized his work for their salvation. At the last supper, he gave it again in the institution of that sacred rite by which his death was to be shown forth till he come. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six, And the sorrow of the disciples at parting from their Lord was comforted with the promise of reunion as he said, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Matthew 26, 28. This is not true. I can say this because Ellen White does not have more information than I do. This is like mumbo jumbo. There is nothing in there that said Jesus gave no cup to his disciples. They were at a wedding and the wine ran out. Everybody was served wine. What does that have to do with the Last Supper? Absolutely nothing. She's just padding up to make a point. How could this be inspired writing? If Ellen White was inspired elsewhere, certainly not in this one. Certainly not in what I'm reading so far. And I just took a, a random account. This is equally her own thoughts as Hannah. So let's continue. The wine which Christ provided for the feast and that which he gave to the disciples as a symbol of his own blood was the pure juice of the grape. To this, the prophet Isaiah refers when he speaks of the new wine in the cluster and says, destroy it not, for a blessing is in it. Isaiah 65 and verse 8. The wine at Cana and the wine Jesus gave his disciples represented his own blood. And this is what Isaiah speaks of. You always hear people say in debates that you have to fact check. You have to Bible check after Ellen White. Now, who is going to begin to take me serious if Sister White is actually lying here or wrong? That, that has nothing to do with Jesus? Are you prepared to declare that your eyes were indeed full of scales? Who is prepared to fight me on this? Let us go to Isaiah 65. I was ready to respond, but no one asked for help. I was ready to be found, but no one was looking for me. I said, here I am, here I am, to a nation that did not call on my name. All day long, I opened my arms to a rebellious people, but they followed their own evil paths and their own crooked schemes. All day long, they insult me to my face by worshiping idols in their sacred gardens. They burn incense on pagan altars. At night, they go out among the graves, worshiping the dead. They eat the flesh of pigs and make stews with other forbidden foods. Yet they say to each other, don't come too close or you will defile me. I am holier than you. These people are a stench in my nostrils, an acrid smell that never goes away. Look, my decree is written out in front of me. I will not stand silent. I will repay them in full. Yes. I will repay them both for their own sins and for those of their ancestors, says the Lord. For they also burned incense on the mountains and insulted me on the hills. I will pay them back in full. But I will not destroy them all, says the Lord. 
For just as good grapes are found among a cluster of bad ones, and someone will say, don't throw them all away, some of those grapes are good. So I will not destroy all Israel, for I still have true servants there. I will preserve a remnant of the people of Israel and of Judah to possess my land. Those I choose will inherit it, and my servants will live there. The plain of Sharon will again be filled with flocks for my people who have searched for me, and the valley of Achor will be a place to pasture herds. Yes, I'm listening. What about this refers to Jesus? What about this refers to the pure juice of the cluster of grapes? God was simply saying, as you just read, that some people say, don't throw away the good grapes with the bad grapes. It's the same way he will not destroy all of Israel. And Ellen White takes this passage to support an erroneous teaching that the wine Jesus gave was pure grape juice, both at Cana and the Last Supper. There is a part of me that is hurting inside. Hurting because error passes so smooth under our noses and we just can't detect it. It was Christ, she says, who in the Old Testament gave the warning to Israel. Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Proverbs 20 and verse 1. And he himself provided no such beverage. Satan tempts men to indulgence that will becloud reason and benumb the spiritual perceptions. But Christ teaches us to bring the lower nature into subjection. His whole life was an example of self-denial. Oh, another set of mix-up of everything again. It's like a knockout punch. It comes so fast you can't see it. She's just pulling unrelated things from everywhere. Solomon, not Christ, said wine is a mocker. And the word is indulgence. We must eat, but gluttony is a sin. So is over drinking of alcohol. The deception is the overdoing. She now goes down the line of appetite, which is nowhere near the account. And you would think she is going into some spiritual inspirational stuff. No, it is wrong to use scripture that way. In order to break the powers of appetite, he suffered in our behalf the severest test that humanity could endure. It was Christ who detected that John the Baptist should drink neither wine nor strong drink. It was he who enjoined similar abstinence among the wife of Manoah, and he pronounced a curse upon the man who should put the bottle to his neighbor's lips. Christ did not contradict his own teaching. The unfermented wine, which he provided for the wedding guest, was a wholesome and refreshing drink. Its effect was to bring the taste into harmony with a helpful appetite. So Ellen White makes this statement with no biblical proof whatsoever, and it is accepted as coming from God. She says that God will never contradict himself, and he will never provide such drink. Well, I want someone to explain to me who gave this instruction, and why is it ignored? Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 24. Now, when the Lord your God blesses you with a good harvest, the place of worship he chooses for his name to be honored might be too far for you to bring the tithe. If so, you may sell the tithe portion of your crops and herds, put the money in a pouch, and go to the place the Lord your God has chosen. When you arrive, you may use the money to buy any kind of food you want, cattle, sheep, goats, wine, or other alcoholic drink. Then feast there in the presence of the Lord your God and celebrate with your household. And do not neglect the Levites in your town, for they will receive no allotment of land among you. Yes, I'm listening. So she's right. God surely does not contradict himself. He never condemned drinking alcoholic wine, but warns against excess from the Old Testament to the New Testament. I also have to do another Bible check on Ellen White's misuse. She talked about God cursing the person who gives his neighbor to drink. Okay, let's read the text in its full context. I will read it in the King James Version first. Habakkuk 2 and verse 1. Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink, that puttest thy bottle to him, and makest him drunken also, that thou mayest look on their nakedness. 
Now, the way this reads gives the impression that just giving your neighbor to drink is wrong. But that is not what the text is saying. Let us read the NLT, which is as plain as the Hebrew. Verse 15. What sorrow awaits you who make your neighbors drunk? You force your cup on them so you can gloat over their shameful nakedness. But soon it will be your turn to be disgraced. Come, drink and be exposed. Drink from the cup of the Lord's judgment and all your glory will be turned to shame. I don't even need to explain. Again, he was scolding his people. He was not condemning drinking or anything like that. He was saying, you who make your neighbors drunk by forcing your cup on them. So even the context is about excess drinking, forcing your cup on them to make someone drunk. Totally isolating the scripture. And those who cannot scrutinize Ellen White because a bolt of lightning will strike them and must drink everything she says as truth, even if it blatantly contradicts the scripture. So far, I have gained nothing from the desire of ages that makes me go, oh, that has to be inspired. All I see is the copying of another man's thoughts, no matter how wrong he is, but also the blatant misuse of scripture to force Adventist beliefs. That, my people, is dangerous because not only are you corrupting the passage, but you are affecting what is Bible theology. I am yet to see the divine inspiration in the word of the desire of ages. I think what would happen is if you don't have Hannah to contrast Ellen White, you would think that the strange things you read are divine inspiration. I have said before, you can read the book if you wish. I am now saying, be careful reading that book. You mightn't be able to detect truth from error. So you might as well save yourself from that and read the Bible yourself. Yes, I said it. And you who are in your right mind, what have we just read? But you know the power of intoxication is as powerful as indoctrination. So what shall we conclude? We have seen that Jesus was invited to a wedding, a wedding reception, and his mother asked him to help the people who had run out of wine. We found out that the good wine referred to here is fermented wine. The word metheo means to be drunk. Jesus' first miracle was to produce wine that was even better than the first good wine. Had nothing to do with grape juice, fresh grape juice. We realize that Hannah and Ellen White inject speculations that can lead us in the wrong direction. We are therefore admonished to read the Bible. If you have nothing to compare and contrast, you would just think that what you are reading from Ellen White is correct information. I have shown you they are not. I think I will do a few like this so that we can unearth some errors that we otherwise would not have. With humility and pain, I present this conclusion to you. What do I say and how do I say it? I will leave the Holy Spirit to speak to you personally. This kind of errors cannot be seen with the naked eye. You have to have microscopes to see them. This is deeper than you think, my dear friends. So take your time and let the Lord speak to you as you read his word. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are hurting in our hearts to know that that which we considered inspired is not inspired. Thank you for opening our eyes and may we ever keep to the Bible and the Bible only. Thank you for the liberation of your word. And bless us now, we pray. For we pray this prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thanks again for watching. If you have been blessed, feel free to like, to share, and to subscribe if you have not yet done so. And as you do, may you rest in the wise, objective, resourceful, and definitive word of God. Music